My name is Daryl Kwao. Great to be with you on the marketplace. Many of us are coming back from the weekend, our weekend shopping with stories about how expensive food items cost. We gave you a heads up last Friday about how much you'd be paying for tomatoes, which is in short supply. For instance, a small size tomato is going for a CD or two. Many of us still in shock about how costly these basic food items are now. Just watch this tomato trader explain to us how prices are fast escalating. This small basket is going for 350 cities. It used to be 150, uh, it used to be 150 cities and it decreased down to 70 and 80 cities. But now, because of the price of tomatoes, which has gone high, we are selling it at 350 cities. And then the big basket, which used to be 150 cities, is now selling at 600 cities. And the paint rubber, which used to be 25 cities, is now selling at 80 cities and 90 cities. Then we come to the small one, which used to be 10 cities, is now selling at 40 cities. Well, this one, the, let's say these ones are not all that good. They are the, the ones that, in fact, got some um, scratches and then this thing from the box. So we put it in a bowl and then sell it at 80 cities. Some are selling it at 700, uh, 70 cities. And then maybe the lowest price right now is 60 cities. The box is selling at, um, that was last week, we bought the box at um, 2,800. Two but this week, we took the box for 2,600. So it means that the price is going down? Yes, but we hope that it's decreased to the normal price. That is if they get more tomatoes from Burkina. And right now they are complaining that the rain, the rain is disturbing the tomatoes. So probably I know the price will be increasing. I am very sure because if you look at the rate at which tomatoes used to come and the rate at which it is coming now, there's a vast difference. M meaning that if we were having like six cars, seven cars coming to Accra, right now we're having like two cars or probably one car coming to Accra. Well, a uh, host of food chain on Join News, Prince of Pierre has done a lot of uh, reporting on tomato trade and joins us with some more insight. As we understand it, Prince, the shortage we're experiencing is as a result of challenges with supply from Burkina Faso, correct? Can you hear me, Prince? I'm not too sure if Prince can hear me. Uh, we can't get audio from him, but uh, as I indicated, Prince Appiah has been doing uh, a lot of reporting on tomato trade. Hopefully, he'll give us some insight about uh, the cost of tomatoes and uh, why we are experiencing a shortage. Can you hear me now, Prince? Can you hear me, Prince? Yeah, Daryl, can you hear me? Ah, now I can hear you, Prince. So I was asking you to uh, tell us uh, what is accounting for this shortage of tomatoes on the market. Yes, um, Daryl, what is really accounting for the shortage is uh, what is happening in Burkina Faso now. Uh, during the lean season, which is between December and May every year, these tomato traders and importers go to Burkina Faso to bring in tomatoes. Um, for the first four months, they go to the southern part of Burkina Faso to get the tomatoes into the country. But with the last two months, which is May, April, they would have to go to the northern part of Burkina Faso. That is where they get majority of the tomatoes for Ghana. But as, I, as, as we speak to you, um, there are a lot of challenges in Burkina Faso. They have this political unrest, and that is accounting for this particular shortage. What the um, uh, militants, the area the militants have captured in Burkina Faso is where the tomato traders and importers often go to in the last two months of the lean season, which is May and April for the tomatoes. And so, so now they are unable to go to these areas because um, the uh, militants have captured these areas and farmers are unable to go to their farms and most of their crops 
are getting spoiled on the farm. That is why there is shortage. So our local farm, um, local transporters and traders are unable to go to these areas because it's very dangerous. And so that is why we are not getting the tomatoes. The number of tomatoes we get often during this period, which is more than 50 trucks a day for the six months. So now what they manage to get currently is between three and five trucks um, a day from some part of the southern part of Burkina Faso. They are unable to go to the northern part, and that is a challenge why we are getting a lot of shortage in, uh, in the country. Is it the case that we can't grow enough tomatoes here in Ghana? Yes, um, we can grow, but uh, you see, during the lean season, uh, there are two it's one, the one is with irrigation and the other is with the type of um, in the journey to withstand the weather and the drought as well. And so we would have to get new varieties that can withstand the weather and have a longer shelf life. And we are told that government through the Obata, Obata Parkes, uh, initiative and other initiatives are trying to get new um, seed varieties to help our local farmers produce during the lean season because it is just six months and the rest of the uh, year, the um, tomato traders and transporters rely on the local farm, uh, local farmers for the tomatoes. So as I speak to you now, this shortage is going to last till the end of the month. Uh, from June, the local produce, uh, production will start coming on, onto the market and we are going to get to market. But from now till the end of the month, we should expect more shortages, Daryl. Well, thank you so much, uh, Prince Pierre, bringing us that update. And it doesn't look good, like in the case, until uh, the end of the month, we are going to see uh, this uh, sort of thing going on. We have heard a lot about boosting local production to ensure there is enough food supply. and. Is it time to seriously consider genetically modified crops? Well, Dr. Daniel Oseo Fusu is senior research scientist with the Biotechnology and uh, Nuclear Greek Research <laughs> Institute. I'm really grateful for your time uh, this afternoon. Where are we currently with the introduction of GMOs? Can you hear me, Dr. Fusu? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Dr. I can hear you loud and clear. So I was just uh, kind of wondering where we are currently with the introduction of GMOs. Well, Ghana currently has two crops um, that are under trials, um, rice and cowpea. And these have been bred to have, for example, um, crop protection um, traits for the cowpea. It's protected against the um, Maruka retrata insects that can cause up to 80% losses in um, areas with heavy infestation and we also have um, rice um, that is engineered to be nitrogen use efficient, water use efficient and salt tolerant. Okay. Um, currently the, an application for the general environmental release of the first phase of the uh, cowpea has been um, sent to the National Wildlife Safety Authority who is the regulator of GMOs in the country. We are having this conversation uh, amid concerns of a, a food crisis. How effectively do you think that uh, genetically modified crops can help with dealing with the situation? Um, so I'm happy uh, the gentleman you interviewed before me mentioned some of the factors that are causing some of these uh, food crises we are having. Mm. Um, you will recall that farmers have been complaining about high cost of fertilizer, and um, that, this is because um, the main source, sources of fertilizers are facing shortages um, as a result of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Uh, but we also have crops that have been engineered to be able to use nitrogen efficiently. Nitrogen is usually the base for most of the fertilizers. So we have um, nitrogen uh, use efficient crops that uh, we can engineer. Mm. Um, another uh, issue, and I think um, was mentioned just before this, was the issue of rains. 
Um, the average farmer in Ghana does not have access to irrigation facilities. Um, when you expect it to rain, it doesn't rain. And when it rains, it's, it comes in torrents. Um, we, we are able to engineer crops that are, use water efficiently, so very little water. Um, it's also, we also have crops that can switch on and off their genes, such that if there's a flood, it just takes just the amount of water it needs. And if there's no flood, it goes to its normal use of water. Um, there are so many ways that we can use um, GM technology to help solve some of these food crises that we are currently facing. And it all depends on the, the focus that as a country we want to, to push the technology. And, and speak about focus as a country, I guess that is uh, one of the, challenge, the challenges that you face uh, with the adoption of GM crops in Ghana. Uh, tell me about your engagement with government, how that is being received. Of course, there are issues with public skepticism about the usage of GMOs as well. Yes. So um, the biggest challenge we have as a country is that we, we don't have a crop. We don't have a GM crop. Mm. So there's a lot of... Um, Uh, misconception in the mind of what we seek to do. If we had a crop, uh, and that's what we are seeking to do with this copy, we have a crop that uh, farmers are growing and people are eating. Um, people understand that it is just another tool in the hands of a plant breeder. Um, your, your guest before me mentioned the variety that is grown in Ghana and how different it is from the variety in Burkina Faso. Mm. We can um, engineer um, crops that have the same attributes that these Burkina uh, varieties have. And we can grow them even during the lean season because it would use nutrients uh, and use uh, all the inputs efficiently. Um, what we as scientists can do to deal with the public skepticism is to put ourselves out there and educate people. Most people don't realize that GM is just another tool. It's just one of the many tools that a plant breeder uses to produce new and improved varieties. Um, and like I said, also to improve public skepticism, we need to have that the crop out there doing what we say it does and people seeing that it's, it's, it's doing that. And for people listening uh, this afternoon, how would this impact on the economy if we're able to invest in GM crops, have them in abundance even for export, do you think? Yes, so um, it, what the main thing it will do is it will reduce our reliance on imports of certain commodities. Um, I'm happy you talked about tomato. In 2020 alone, uh, Ghana is estimated to have imported uh, over $200 million worth of tomatoes and tomato products. Um, together with other similar imports, it puts a huge strain on our foreign reserves and it has a rippling effect on our, on our economy. And it also leaves us at the mercy of these producing countries. Um, the, the, the gentleman before me talked about um, uh, insurgents in the, in the north of Burkina Faso uh, causing us not to have tomatoes like we usually do. Mm. Uh, we remember at the, at the height of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the, the problem with shipping uh, goods out across the world. Um, so if we have crops that are, are suited to the needs of our country, uh, our economy becomes a bit more robust and it will ensure that we become increasingly more food secure as a country. $200 million worth of uh, tomato imports, that's, that's really huge. Uh, thanks very much for your time, uh, Dr. Daniel Selfosu, Senior Research Scientist uh, uh, with uh, BNARI speaking with us. You're watching The Marketplace. Let's switch to some power issues because Joy Business understands the recent intermittent power outages across parts of the country are due to gas shortage. The power plants that rely on gas have switched to light crude and diesel fuel oil to run their plants. This is expected to impact on the cost of operations of businesses. There is more in this report. 
According to information gathered by Joy Business, there's currently a shortfall or deficit of about 364 megawatts of power in the country. This has compelled the power authorities to shed load at Kaswa, Pokrasi and Aumaso power plants in the central Greater Accra and Ashanti regions. The situation is said to have started three months ago and keep worsening. Joy Business Guard that Twin City and Sen Power currently run on light crude oil, while Scar Power is still down together with the combined oil unit at Tico at Abuaze in the Western Region. We further understand that managers of the Ghana Grid Company and the Electricity Company of Ghana over the weekend visited these power stations to ascertain the current situation. The operators of these power plants, however, promised to restore the load shed when gas pressures improve and additional generation units come on board. Well, joining us on Zoom, Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Security, Nana Amwesi the seventh. Uh, hopefully, we have him on Zoom. Uh, great to have you on the program this afternoon. What do you make of this reporting that gas shortage is to blame for the power disruptions you have uh, seen recently? If you can hear me, uh, what do you make of this uh, reporting, Nana Amwesi, about gas uh, gas shortage uh, being? the reason for the disruptions we have witnessed recently? Or Durham, what we are picking from the IES text is that it all started with a flashover um, caused by lighting at a substation in Winneba. Mm. This substation is linked to transmission line um, connected to the Abuazi Tema enclave. Unfortunately, the lighting arrestor at this substation could not divert the high voltage to the ground, uh, resulting in a short circuit and the high current in same line. The, the circuit breakers at um, Abuadi T1 and T2 were forced open, causing these power plants to trip. It cascaded into uh, a partial, uh, you know, collapse of the system when other plants, including Sem Power, Car Power, Mandi, um, uh, went down. And so it all started this way. Talk of gas supply. Yes, um, the trippings could, you know, um, affect gas supply as well. One, the compressors that are pumping this gas from, um, uh, Atwab will have the same power or get their power source from the same grid. And so if there is no seamless changeover to a standby plant, then of course it will be difficult to get the gas to this uh, um, thermal plant. Also, when the power plant trip and the compressors went down, it will take some time to get the, you know, um, the shutdown valves to be activated. And so that's the challenge that we pick from the IES decks, if you ask. Okay, and so we are told that uh, they are now using light crude and diesel fuel oil. I'm just wondering how sustainable is that? Yes, when the trip of care and gas uh, pressures went low, some uh, plants had to rely on fuel oil and light crude oil. Mm. Um, as we speak, we get indication that T1 and T2 are back running on gas. Unfortunately, the, the, the steam components of these two plants are not back because when you trip this way, it takes some time and a lot of work to get them back uh, into the stream. But it becomes quite worrying that almost three days after this incident, government is tight-lipped, become quite suspicious. And so we urge government to speak to the issue for Ghanaians to understand understand what exactly is happening, and uh, that will shape our mind and our focus going forward. Exactly. And we're hearing from Gridco uh, this afternoon. It has released a statement on the outages witnessed over the weekend. Uh, stay with me. I want to read that to you. Uh, we can hopefully show you that on the screen. Okay. It says that the past system experienced a system disturbance due to a faulted equipment on the Takwade extension Winneba line. 
Consequently, all generating plants in Abuazi Thermal except Kwong uh, Thermal Power Plant, Bui and Kwong, were forced to shut down. Now, this caused forced outages within the coastal corridor of the national grid, which led to power supply interruptions in some parts of the greater Kwao, western, central, middle, and northern parts of the country. However, Kosumbo and Kwong Thermal Plants continue to be in service, supplying power. Restoration began immediately, and supply was restored to all bulk supply points by 23, uh, 29 hours. Gridco assures its valued stakeholders that it will continue to work towards the provision of reliable power system for Ghana's social economic uh, development and apologizing for any inconvenience caused. Uh, this is the only explanation we are getting now for the weekend's outages and also brings to fore uh, the issues with maintenance, Nana. Um, getting this release from Gridco is uh, believing at least some form of information has come out collaborating what we are picked from uh, mm. the corridors right. of industry players. Um, now we're talking about the faults. Yes, because we all understand that over the past years, there have not been adequate investment into uh, the grade. And then so the, the component, the lines, the, you know, the, all the equipment are, are weak. And that's why we are seeing the upgrade. We will encourage government to speed up this upgrade so that we don't get this, uh, um, you know, capacity outages so often. Unfortunately, in the 2022 electricity supply and demand plan, it's no, it makes no room for uh, imports. But if these outages and uh, gas supply uh, issues will linger, then of course IES will. Uh, you know, advise government to make provision for imports when become necessary because uh, demand for power is increasing at a very respectable rate and uh, Ghanaians cannot afford to go back to the dark days. I agree and uh, would appreciate if we get some more uh, clarity <clears throat> on what's happening uh, from the powers that be. Thank you so much, uh, Nana Mwisi, the seventh executive director of the IS. Appreciate your time. Next, we take you to Nigeria, where airlines say they have called off a plan to ground domestic flights. Uh, Importers are the spiraling cost of aviation fuel. It has risen almost fourfold this year, which was unsustainable, according to airline operators of Nigeria. The hikes have been triggered principally by Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the end of February, but the airlines say flights will now go ahead as negotiations with the government are continuing. Earlier, I spoke with uh, Bokola Joe Oketumbi of Channels TV. As we all know, aviation fuel powers the aircraft. And for most airlines, that's about 40% of their operating cost. But in Nigeria, because of the fluctuating foreign exchange, the price is raising in February when there was the first outcry by the airline operators of Nigeria, the fuel price had moved from 190 Naira per litre to about 500, 570, 600. Mm. And that was in, that was about February to about March 3rd. And at that time, the upper legislative house had called everyone to a meeting, the marketers, the uh, National Petroleum Company, trying to chart a way forward and said they were going to peg the price for them at 500 Naira. But that did not take place. And so some over, over last week, the airline operators of Nigeria had come out to say that they were going to shut down. And of course, that had sent like shivers down the government's spine. That's one mode of transportation in Nigeria because there is a lot of insecurity and our roads mm. are not safe. A lot of people do not want to travel by road. They don't want to take the risk. If you're kidnapped, are you going to risk the ransom and all of that? But of course, we have a few quite poor road infrastructure here and there across the country. So and so the, if the airline... I didn't hear that. So we know that the domestic airlines have uh, rescinded the decision to uh, ground their flights. We know they are in negotiations with uh, the government. Uh, are we hearing anything? What's the latest on that? And uh, does it look like it's going to be fruitful, the negotiations with uh, the Nigerian government? I know at the moment there is um, a meeting between the, the, between the parties and the lower legislative house. Whether there would be um, a consensus, so to speak, I'm not sure. Because what happened in February, I guess governments across Africa and even Nigeria have a way of coming to 
a decision, but never following through with the implementation. Because that's where the problem lies. Calling meetings and make um, ensuring that, yes, we come to a consensus is always very easy, but will it be implemented? In February and March, early March, when they had that meeting, nothing came out of it. The government has said the price will be pegged at 500, but it didn't happen. Let's be hopeful that it could happen this time. Okay. And you talk about the fact that uh, people rely so much on domestic travel because the roads are not safe. Tell us yeah. how the Nigerian economy would be impacted if the airlines go ahead to ground flights if there is no fruitful outcome to the negotiations right now. Okay. Like I said, you know, the road is not very safe. In 2019, Aviation was the fastest growing sector, according to our statistics record from the country. And of course, you know that aviation is a connector of people, it's a connector of goods, it's a connector of services and all of that. So that's very critical. If one of your major forms of transportation is crippled, then of course the national economy is affected. Because whether we like it or not, the airline operators pay taxes to government. And once it is out of the way, there are no tax revenue for government as well. So that's one of the critical ways. Plus, Intra-country travel is going to be very limited. That road option that many people didn't want to take is what they're going to resort to. And somehow it's also going to affect the economy because, of course, the aviation is seen to be, for some, like, um, will I say, luxurious. And so there are a lot of taxes that go with that form of travel. So I, I, one of the ways government is going to be impacted is beyond people moving, the taxes will also be available for government. And as we watch the situation there in Nigeria, I guess you're wondering what's happening here in Ghana. It's uh, a story we would explore later. Thanks for watching The Marketplace. My name is Daryl Kwao. More news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Goodbye.